If I listen to a video and say, what, enough, I usually end up doing commentary on it. This is one of those videos, and I find myself having that reaction a lot when it comes to live actions content. Hello, and welcome to, or back to, my channel. I'm Kit, and today, Lila Rose interviewed Allie Beth Stuckey. Before we get into it, I would like to note that I don't know Lila or Allie, and these are my thoughts and opinions on the content they put out for public consumption. That being said, thank you for clicking on this video, and I would like to give extra thanks to my patrons. Links to my socials and Patreon are below, along with sources and resources, and now, on to the reason we're all here. Lila Rose is the founder and president of Live Action, an anti-abortion organization, and Ali Beth Stuckey, formerly known as the Conservative Millennial, is a conservative Christian who hosts the podcast Relatable. In July, these two sat down for an interview which was titled Unapologetically Pro-Life with the thumbnail Abolishing Abortion, and I really do admire conservative wordplay. When I think of pro-life, I think of someone who wants to make life better for people, not how these folks use it, which is to simultaneously force pregnant people to carry the term no matter what but, and now forbid people who are unable to become pregnant or carry the term from using reproductive technology. We're just going to get right into it, but first, a disclaimer. When I refer to Christianity, I'm talking about Lila and Allie's brand, not Christians in general. And this video mentions abortion, which I'm sure is a surprise. You might want to give this one a skip if referring to women as people offends you or if pro-choice people in general offend you. And for anyone wondering, pro-choice means you support whichever choice the pregnant person makes because you understand it's not your business or your body, usually both. Let's dive in. So you're unapologetic about complete rejection of abortion. You know, there's a lot of people, even in the conservative space, who are like, some abortions, I can understand. It's like, no, this is killing a baby. You're unapologetic about things like IVF and surrogacy, about calling, you know, the evils associated evil, even though there's obviously the beauty of a new life with at IVF. In some cases, it can bring new life into the world. Many lives are killed. Um, you've been very on the cutting edge of a lot of that. I think in the conservative space where people right now, especially on the pro-life side, are even saying, no, we need to protect IVF at all costs. I mean, there's kind of moral confusion, I would say, in the pro-life space even at this time. What forms your moral vision? How did you get to have the moral vision that you have? And it sounds like you've had this for years. It's not something that you've developed recently. You've had it since yeah. before you even started your work. Well, definitely pro-life, definitely have always been against abortion. It is so weird to me that their definition of pro-life begins and ends at abortion. The instant you're actually born, well, though I guess their definition of pro-life also includes being anti-IVF and anti-surrogacy, which would be creating new life. Being against rape and incest exceptions doesn't surprise me if you think abortion is murder, being against exceptions tracks, which is one of the reasons any pro-life politician claiming there are exceptions shouldn't be trusted. But being anti-IVF and anti-surrogacy, I just don't follow. And their explanation doesn't make much sense. And on that note, years ago, Allie used to believe in exceptions, but a Facebook comment made her realize that was wrong. And I guess we should address this. For some context, the Facebook comment asked Allie about the difference between a baby conceived consensually and a baby conceived in rape, and Allie realized she wasn't considering things from the baby's perspective. Which is, of course, what we find with a lot of pro-choice people is that they haven't even really considered what an abortion is or what's happening in an abortion or why they believe that abortion is okay because they're not considering the life that is being killed. I know what an abortion is, I know how they're done, and I believe it's okay because, in short, bodily autonomy is the most important thing we have. If you don't own your body, you own nothing. We don't mandate that anyone who is able to donate organs, yes, for some organs you can be a living donor, or even blood, do so. We don't even mandate that corpses donate their organs. Even after you no longer have any use for them, even after you no longer care, even after you can no longer state your wishes, we recognize bodily integrity. But for some reason, with pregnancy and just pregnancy, that should be thrown out the window? Pregnancy isn't just nine months of inconvenience and then a bit of pain. Pregnancy alters your body in general and it can do so in life-altering and even fatal ways. And the U.S. has the highest maternal mortality rate among wealthy nations. And instead of focusing on that, and it's not impossible, other countries have figured it out, so could we, Lila and Allie, staunch pro-lifers, choose to focus on outlawing abortion. 
But back to the question at hand, why is it just pregnancy? Why is it that once you're born, once you can start to feel, think, dream, why is it then that what happens to you no longer matters? Parents aren't required to donate blood or organs to their kids. It's only during pregnancy that you're required to put your own life at risk. And besides the importance of bodily autonomy, I find the hypocrisy disgusting. And for the, the baby is a separate body crowd, it's not a separate body until it's no longer connected to another body, the body that keeps it alive. And you can't put the body that depends on another body to sustain itself above the one doing the sustaining. Pregnancy and birth are messy and complicated. You can do all the right things and still end up in a life or death situation. And how far do they want to take this? Do they want miscarriages investigated? Women of childbearing age to forego certain medications in case they become pregnant? And if you're banning abortion, what is the plan for the children born who need medical care that their parents can't afford. There is no universal health care in the U.S. What is the plan for kids given up for adoption? Though some people unable to get an abortion will decide to keep their kids, more births creates more kids up for adoption, more kids in foster care. And our systems are abysmal as it is. And I haven't heard of anything to improve them, let alone expand. All this to say, they put a lot of focus on outline abortion, but not on what comes after. And I think that's how it will be for as long as live action exists. Roe was overturned, now we have to focus on states. States have outlawed abortion, now we have to go after underground abortion. It will just keep going because abortion will never actually cease to exist. And though it's probably unintentional, it seems to me that they will do anything to avoid having to care about actual babies, not fetuses or embryos. Sorry for the rant, this is something that drives me up a wall. Anyway, let's talk about IVF, the main issue of which seems to be the creation of multiple embryos. I had no idea that all of these little tiny defenseless image bearers of God are being abandoned on ice indefinitely, are being discarded, are being thawed, are being killed. Her other issue seems to be the testing of embryos for sex and disabilities, which Allie calls eugenics. Eugenics is a set of beliefs and practices that aim to improve the genetic quality of a human population. Historically, eugenicists have altered various human gene frequencies by inhibiting the fertility of people and groups purported to be inferior or promoting that of those purported to be superior. I'm not an expert, but I don't think screening your own embryos for disabilities is eugenics. I'm pretty sure you would want to implant the ones that look like they'll have the most success, but I'm not an expert. Let me know if you disagree or if I'm wrong. Back to Allie, she acknowledges this is a sense subject and she's been harping on it for years but no she won't let it go people's minds can be changed and she is determined to be that change because just like with abortion so many people don't look at it from the perspective of the embryo from the perspective of the baby when it comes to surrogacy and all kinds of reproductive technology and if we want to be consistent about upholding the dignity of babies from the point of conception then we have to consider that when it comes to reproductive technology too. People don't consider the embryo or fetus's perspective because they don't have one. And even if they did, again, we don't force parents to donate organs or even blood if it would save their kids because in all other situations except pregnancy, we understand the importance of bodily autonomy. But it doesn't even matter. Even if you create one embryo at a time and try to do IVF as ethically as possible, it's still a no-go for Allie. Do I think that that is better than creating, say, a dozen embryos. Yes, I think it is better. Of course, I think it's better. But you still have to ask the questions, the ethical, moral, and biblical questions as Christians of what happens when we take conception outside of its intended context, which is in the context of love, in the context of sex between a husband and a wife. Um, whenever technology takes us, this is a phrase we say a lot on Relatable, whenever technology takes us from what is natural to what is possible, we have to ask, is this moral? Sometimes it is. Not all technology is bad. But when you're talking about creating life and creating life outside of its intended context, there are just going to be a lot of consequences, a lot of questions that we have to ask. If Allie wants to ask herself biblical questions regarding the ethics of something, that's her right and I respect it. What I don't respect is the expectation that everyone should follow the dictates of her biblical conclusions. And Allie has spoken to Congress in support of anti-abortion policies. These aren't just her personal beliefs she's sharing, she does want them to be the law. And if you're wondering what Allie would have people who are unable to become pregnant without assistance do, she recommends adoption over waiting into an ethically questionable decision. She also calls adoption redemptive, which makes me a bit wary. And like Brett Cooper, Allie is telling others to do something she has not done. 
Lala suggests there's a mentality in our society where we feel entitled to be a parent and so pursue it to whatever ends we can. And she knows adoption isn't free, right? It sounds as though Lila believes adoption is about the kid and IVF is about the parents, but this whole discussion just leads to the fact that they believe pregnancy should only be done naturally. And if that way doesn't work for you, you should adopt. And really a lot of forms of reproductive technology, you're asking the child, you're asking the baby to sacrifice on your behalf. With IVF, even when you're doing the more ethically route of just creating one embryo, the rate of attrition is high. The chances of that embryo thawing, not making it to transfer, um, is really high. So that's not even talking about what happens after the embryo is in the womb and whether or not it's going to implant like the process of going to the lab to the womb is very risky and you are asking that defenseless child without you know their consent saying i want you to make that risky possibly deadly journey because I think I am justified based on my desire to have a child. Let's take a moment to appreciate how Allie is so concerned over the perspective, consent, and sacrifice of an embryo, but she has no such concern over the perspective, consent, or sacrifice of a pregnant person. Coincidentally, the pregnant person would be able to voice their perspective, consent, and sacrifice, and yet somehow an embryo's presumed wants and needs trump that of the one they're depending on to sustain their existence. That's the whole idea with IVF is I'm gonna go create this life to then enter this journey of danger and difficulty and often even death because yeah. some babies like you're saying many are so many are discarded yeah. or, or frozen indefinitely let's also take a moment to appreciate the concern for the journey of danger and difficulty and often death for an embryo but actual babies eh. and on this topic Allie asks lila what the catholic church says about the theology of the body and i'm sure lila's response will shock you it's always wrong to separate the procreative from the unitive what that means, and you were speaking to this earlier really beautifully, but marriage, the sex belongs within marriage and sex is designed to be open to life. It doesn't always bring life. Obviously we know that women's not always fertile. It doesn't always happen. And it's designed to be unitive, bringing the couple together and they're married, their sacramental love. And with IVF, you're plucking the unitive away from the procreative. So you're now saying, I'm gonna go create this baby in a test tube or whatever, and it's no longer in the marriage bed. Mm. And so that, even if there was, everything else was taken care of with IVF, somehow magically, right? Which can't, I mean, it's just not the way it works. Um, it would still be wrong because you're removing the, the marriage love, as you said earlier, the bond of love from the act of bringing that life into the world. Mm. And children deserve that. Yeah. that natural order that God designed. And there's biological safeguards built into that too. Mm -hmm. Right. IVF will always be wrong because it removes sex from the equation and children deserve to be conceived via sex. Right. Can anyone tell me what biological safeguards Lila is talking about? Anyway, Lila says that, like with evangelicals, there's many Catholics who don't understand because, of course, their understanding is the right understanding and the church's teaching is very clear, which Lila is grateful for. And these two are just... Oddly smug, which I guess you have to be to be so convinced you're right that you think your beliefs should be the law of the land. This is all made worse by the revelation that Allie has friends who have kids conceived via IVF, and she wants us all to know that those kids are also made in the image of God, but the parents should repent for using IVF. And it's the pro-life position, right, that no matter the means of your fertilization exactly. conception, you're a child of God, you're made in his image, and you are precious, you know, your life is sacred. But that doesn't always mean the means of your conception, because we deal with these cases all the time in the pro-life space, you know, that, you know, unplanned pregnancy outside of marriage or, you know, severe cases of sexual violence. I mean, all of these yeah. different cases that are often used to justify abortion, right? But the means of your fertilization, your conception does not determine your value. Right. Your value is unbreakable. You, you are valuable because you're human, period. Exactly. This is just wild to me. IVF and sexual violence can't even see the same level. They're so far apart. And trying to act otherwise is just, I can't even think of a word to describe how ludicrous that is. And then this, we're all made in the image of God. We all have inherent value because we're human, but there is some differences in the manner of conception. I wish they would just be honest and say they feel superior because they were able to become pregnant and carry their pregnancy to term as opposed to those who can't. But instead they have to feed their egos by couching it in terms of, it's what's best for the babies. You have to think about the baby's perspective. 
Bullshit. If it was really about babies, Live Action's mission would be to ensure every baby is fed, clothed, and sheltered instead of focusing on outlawing abortion. And just that. They don't promote sex ed or offer free contraception. They just lobby to outlaw abortion. And now, apparently, IVF and surrogacy. But enough about IVF. Let's talk about feminism. I look at modern feminism today, and I know we, we both share this, and so much of it has just gone insane. It's all about abortion. It's all about even like caught up in the LGBT stuff, which is weird because they don't know what a woman any is anymore. So how can you be pro-woman and you can't define woman or anyone can be a woman? Honestly, I wish people who don't like feminism or are against it just wouldn't talk about it. If Lila wanted to, she can learn why feminists care about abortion access and marginalized groups and why it's important to advocate for all women. But she doesn't care, so trying to explain it would either be met with a brick wall or bad faith. But I also think that there's an extreme there that can happen where people say that, uh, you know, women in general are not, you know, there's this extreme of feminism today. And then there's the truth about what is what is womanhood for. What a wordsmith. There's an extreme there that people say women in general are not what? No, I don't know. Please finish your thought. And no, just stating there is an extreme of feminism today isn't finishing that thought. If you're going to make a statement like that, you need to back it up. And for that matter, if you're going to mention the truth about what womanhood is for, please also tell us what you think that is. Because if left to my own devices, I'm going to guess the feminist extreme is that women should decide their own lives and what womanhood is for is marriage and babies. Which is what makes Lila consider feminism extreme because it doesn't advocate for women to marry and have kids. But instead of sharing her own thoughts on that, Lila asks Allie what she thinks women need to hear today about what it means to be a woman. Allie gives a very long answer about how your value isn't tied to being a wife or mother or how productive you can be. Your value comes from being created in God's image. I had no idea how similar girl defined an Allie are. She goes on to stress that God also purposely made you female. You're not just a human, but a human female. And God found male-female differences so important. They're in the first chapter. And there are things women can do that are very different from what men can do. Obviously, the greatest superpower, the most unique thing about us is that we have a womb, that we can create children, that we can create life, that we can nourish that life with our bodies. I mean, that is so incredible and so amazing. I'm not surprised that was her example of how women are different from men, but I hate this so much. A woman is not just a womb. A woman isn't unique because she has a womb. A womb doesn't define a woman. A womb isn't a personality trait. And that is the only thing Allie mentions about the things women can do that are very different from what men can do. She didn't even try for other stereotypes like nurturing or cooking or anything. She just parroted girl defined and said that wife and mother isn't necessarily a woman's highest calling. Your highest calling, of course, is to glorify God. But hey, at least she says you can glorify God while single. And of course. All women are called to mother in one way or another. And you actually see that self manifest itself in some, I think, unhealthy ways in our culture in either replacing um, children with your job, replacing children with, with your pets. dog. <laughs> yes, with pets, replacing them with plants, replacing them with your boyfriend, whatever it is. We all have this natural biological urge as women to nurture, to nourish, and to mother and to raise up. and. We are, in some ways, and I think feminism has really done this, we are trying to suppress that urge and channel it into something else, things that are much lesser than that. A woman not having kids, but having a job, pets, or plants isn't suppressing her urge to have kids and mothering lesser things instead. Perhaps don't assume things about people you don't know, or even people you do know. I'm not saying that it's bad to love your pets or to love your plants or to date, have a boyfriend or love your job even, but as long as we put them in their rightful place. Can someone please tell these two that they don't get to decide what gets what place in someone else's life? They try to pretend they're smart and have everything figured out, but what they really do is look at people who don't live the way they think they should and make wild assumptions, which they speak of as truth. Allie's conclusion is that if God isn't giving you children, you should seek out discipleship and mentorship opportunities. And then they discuss a study that shows fewer women wanting kids. Allie, of course, decides this is because women are becoming more liberal. And that is a godless ideology that worships the little G God of self. And it urges you to sacrifice all kinds of things, including your own children on the altar of your own happiness. That's what the God of self does. The God of self is very cruel. The God of self says, you must worship me. You must serve me at all costs. And the God of self says, 
whatever makes me happy, whatever feels good in the moment, whatever I can do that's within my control, however I identify, whatever I declare that I am, I am. That is what the God of self does. How can you sacrifice kids that haven't even been born? The point of all of this is to tell us that we should follow the Bible because it will give us direction and purpose and fulfillment and God wants what's best for us. And if we don't do that, we'll be a slave to ourselves and that's bad because we'll have to fulfill our every whim? I'm honestly not trying to be obtuse, I just don't get it. Allie did write and publish You're Not Enough and That's Okay, which is about escaping the toxic culture of self-love. I get it now. If you love yourself, respect yourself, whatever you want to call it, you set boundaries, you recognize when things are not good for you, you recognize when things are unhealthy, the list goes on, and that doesn't work for Allie and Lila's brand of Christianity. They need you to die to self, not respect yourself. Glad we could figure that out. And when you have an entire industry, a self-love, self-help industry that tells you the only way to be happy and the only way to find fulfillment is to perpetually do what you want to do in any given moment, no matter who you cut out of your life, no matter what commitments you forego, no matter what sacrifices you avoid, just do what you want to do in any given moment. I don't think Allie has ever read a self-help, self-improvement, self-love, whatever book. It is not about doing whatever you want, whenever you want, no matter who you hurt or let down. Yes, it is about setting boundaries, which could lead to cutting people out who don't respect them, which could be family. Yes, it includes being mindful of what you want and not just doing what others want you to do to make them happy like following tradition. In short, it is about respecting yourself, which by the way, doesn't mean stagnating and never changing because you think you're perfect, but also being there for those important to you. And Allie hates it because again, her brand of Christianity needs you to die to self, not respect yourself. An industry that worships and profits from the God of self, then yeah, you're going to get a lot of women who think that they're sticking it to the patriarchy by saying, no, I'm gonna do what I want to do, which means I never want to be inconvenienced. I never want to be burdened beyond, you know, what I desire. Patriarchal societies do hate it when women do what they want to do instead of following the script, but no one can get through life without being inconvenienced or burdened beyond what they desire. That's just a stupid thing to say. Does Allie really think everyone wakes up with a desire to go to work every day? Does Allie really think everyone wants to pay bills, take the car for an oil change, go to the dentist? No, but though adulthood does have its benefits, it also has its drawbacks. One of which is, you know, being an adult. Allie mentions the TikToks and videos she's seen trying to justify it. She mentions Chelsea Handler, so I assume she's talking about the decision to not have kids. Allie thinks making videos about that topic is protesting too much and they conclude that it promotes consumption and is a sad way to live. Isn't it lucky then that they're free to conduct their lives as they see fit and have as many kids as they wish? Lila brings up social media and how it makes us zombies and Allie says it's a contagion because you see things that go viral and think it's cool and... Because we are true. constantly feel the pressure to have empathy for every single person on earth and every single thing they're going through, every single conflict in the world is at our fingertips and on our shoulders and we don't have the capacity actually to care about all of those things. Allie has another book coming out, Toxic Empathy, How Progressives Exploit Christian Compassion. I wish I was kidding. Lila suggests that being able to see all the horrible things going on in the world gets people thinking they don't even want to bring a kid into this world and let's remember why we're here. What do you think the pro-life movement needs to do more of or do differently in order for us to win. And by win, I mean not just continue to be moving forward as a movement, but to abolish abortion, make it totally illegal, and to make it unthinkable. I'm going to guess the things that actually lower abortion rates aren't going to be part of Allie's response. And after telling Lila she's so thankful for what she's done, Allie answers with this. I think continuing as hard as it is to hear talking about what exactly abortion is and what the abortion logic is and why it necessarily informs what we think about exceptions, what we think about IVF, what we think about surrogacy. Um, I think that we really all need to get on the same page there and we need to do everything that we can to make sure that our elected officials are on the same page. Well, I appreciate the honesty. And if you're wondering what Allie means by what exactly abortion is, I'll link some of Mama Dr. Jones' videos below and caution everyone to take what abortion abolitionists have to say about it with a large grain of salt. Everyone has their 
different places in the pro-life movement, but there's got to be people over here that are shifting the Overton window. There's got to be people over here who stake their ground and say no, not just no to abortion sometimes, but no to abortion all the time. No to all of the questionable things happening in reproductive technology because those babies' lives really matter. That was pretty much it. Alec concludes she can't compromise to win elections and she's looking at the long game and it took 50 years to end Roe versus Wade. And you might have noticed that through this video, they didn't mention women. It was all about the baby. And that is an example of how conservatives control the conversation. They're talking about embryos and I'm not being a snarky pro-choicer. They were literally talking about IVF, but instead they use the term baby. And this is done deliberately. Instead of ending a pregnancy, abortion then becomes about killing babies, which most people have a visceral reaction to. But abortion is not infanticide, however much people like Lila and Allie try to convince us that it is. And though they did try to mock what is a woman, they didn't even pretend to consider women in this discussion. And when I realized this, it blew my mind. How are you going to discuss abortion, IVF, surrogacy, actually they forgot to talk about surrogacy, without talking about the people who are pregnant? Without them, there's nothing to talk about. But I do appreciate Allie's honesty. She's shifting the Overton window so things that would have once seemed unthinkable, like no exceptions, become normal. I suspect that's what they mean when they say their goal is to make abortion unthinkable. It's not that people will shudder in disgust at the idea, it's that it will simply become normal for it to be completely illegal. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.